I'm going to talk to you about a revolution, uh, first in philosophy. Uh, my talk is basically half philosophy, half statistics. The title of the talk is The Crisis in Evidence. And what I basically want to do is I want to show you that probability and statistics have overpromised and have led to basically a pandemic of overcertainty, uh, particularly in uh, what we might call the softer sciences, and in particular those fields that use these types of things uh, to regulate us. So basically what I want to tell you is that probability and statistics cannot do what they promise to do in its classical sense, and that's to show causation. And that's a philosophical topic, and I want to explain that first. And then I'm going to show you that even if we assume that probability and statistics can show causation, even if we do understand causation, the procedures that we use are wrong, and they should be adjusted. I know my voice is kind of loud. And they should be adjusted and done in a completely different way. And that way is essentially just what Ed was telling us. We replicate, we replicate, we have a model, we make predictions, we see if those predictions are upheld. And we have to do that repeatedly. Uh, the problem with probability and statistics is they seem to show us, um, give a shortcut. They, they seem to promise uh, that we could know things with very little effort. And I'm going to prove that to you. So what are traditionally probability and statistics used for? What do you think they're used for? Well, I say it's only one thing, to explain or to quantify the uncertainty in that which we do not know. That's it, to explain or quantify uncertainty in that which we do not know, and nothing else. Strangely, however, classical procedure, in both its frequentist, if you've heard of these things, and Bayesian, if you have, both of these classical procedures say the opposite. So let me give you a little example. We'll work with the PM 2.5 example. This is a, I'll use a fictional example at first, uh, which is based on reality, and then I'll use one that was actually used by the California Air Resources Board that I originally got interested in from Jim Enstrom here. So imagine we have two groups of uh, people who are exposed or not to, two, to PM 2.5. A thousand people had either no exposure or just trace exposure, and five of them developed cancer of the L. bondigus. Okay? Five. And in another group, another thousand people, which are exposed to some high level, every single person, now this is important that you understand this, every single person in this high group, each thousand, each one thousand persons was exposed at the same level, and fifteen of them developed cancer of the obonigus. So five and 15. Now let me ask you this question. I don't know how many statisticians there are in the audience, but what is the probability? I want someone to answer me here. What is the probability that more people in the high group had cancer? One. One, that's it. So I've proved to you that we do not need probability and statistical models to tell us what we already know. We do not need any other kind of model. We can say that there's three times as many people got sick in the high group, or only five people got sick in the low group. We know these things by observation. We do not need probability and statistics to tell us what we've already seen. But what are the real questions of interest here? What's in our I'm, I'm afraid if you don't know that, we can't mention that in polite company. What are the real questions of interest? Why do you do a statistical study like this? What caused the difference? That's the first. What caused this difference? Something must have caused it. In fact, something must have caused each of the 20 people, each of them must have been caused their cancer. So it may have been the same cause for all 20 people, or it may have been different causes for all 20 people or something in between. But no matter what, something caused each of those cancers. And so we want to know, can probability and statistics answer that question? And the, que and the answer to that is no, although everybody assumes it does. The second question that probability and statistics can answer is, given that I assume I do know the cause, which I cannot learn from probability and statistics, some other way I learn it, 
But assuming I do know the cause, what can I say about future groups of people who are exposed or not? What can I say about the uncertainty in their cancer rates? That's where probability and statistics can be useful. Okay, so what is probability and statistics answer to causality? How do we typically do a statistical procedure in this type of a case? I have 15 people in the low group, or rather five people in the low group and 15 in the high group. What do I normally do? What's that? Some sort of hypothesis test, correct? We've all seen hypothesis tests before. Each hypothesis test is done in exactly the same way. It doesn't matter which one you're doing or what kind of data you're doing or any kind of model that you're using. They all run the same way. Step one is always the same, and that is always to form some sort of usually parameterized probability model for the observed data. And I won't go into this, but we could use something like a binomial distribution. If you know what that is, that's fine. If you don't, it doesn't matter. But there are many different models we might use. Step two is to form what we call the null hypothesis. Have you heard of this before? This is the hypothesis that there is no difference between the groups. Now, we already know that that's false. Did we not say there's 100% probability the groups are different? Yes? So why do, a null, why do a null hypothesis test? We've already ascertained the groups are, in fact, different. 100% certain. Okay, well, we'll come to that question. Number three is to calculate a statistic. A statistic is just a function of the data. Many statistics are available, hence the field statistics. Step four is to calculate this creature. Given the data we've assumed, given the model we've assumed, given the data we've observed, and assuming the null hypothesis is true, we calculate the probability of seeing a test statistic larger than the one we actually got in absolute value, assuming we could repeat the experiment an infinite number of times. This is called the p-value. The p-value for this particular data happens to be, for a test of so-called differences in proportions, 0.04. So what do we say? Why? 0.04 is less than the magic number. The number is magic. Gigerenzer, another critic of the field of statistics, calls this procedure ritual. Uh, Zizek calls it uh, something I can't repeat. I call it magic. It is a magic number. If the p-value is less than the magic number, you have success, you have statistical significance. You can write grants, you can uh, write your papers, it will be accepted, and all this kind of glorious things. What does it mean? Uh, everybody's used p-values here, they must know what it means. Causality was not <clears throat> That's what people say, that's false. That's false. Any, any other explanations? That's also false, yes, all these are false. I just told you what it meant. It meant that, this is, nobody can remember this, it's not your fault, it's very difficult. If I were to ask anybody right now, does anybody even dare repeat what I said the p-value was, the definition? I just told you a minute ago, and we've all used p-values. Given the model we've assumed, given the data we've seen, accepting the null hypothesis is true, it's, calculating the probability of a test statistic larger than the one we actually got in absolute value if we were to repeat the experiment an infinite number of times. And that's all it means. It certainly does not say anything about cause. It does not say in this p-value is less than the magic number, but it does not then prove that PM2.5 is a cause of the cancer of those people in the high group. Consider that something also caused the cancer of the people in the small group, in the low group, the no group. It can't have been PM 2.5. It must have been something else. That's all we could learn, that if we assume PM 2.5 is a cause, if we assume PM 2.5 is a cause, if we don't know it's a cause, then we don't know what caused the cancer of the people in the low group. And we also don't know what caused the cancer in the people in the high group. Now, there's two things to note about this. These are both subtle philosophical points. The first is that if I have a cause, imagine I'm throwing a brick towards a window. 
This brick will break the window, kitchen window, say, just a thin plate glass that you might have in your kitchen window. That brick is the cause of the window breaking. Now, this brick is always the cause. Every time I toss that brick, that brick is going to cause the window to break, unless something stops it. Suppose a hurricane's on its way and you put up the storm shutters. The brick is stopped. So that's the same thing with PM 2.5. If PM 2.5, high PM 2.5, is a cause, it is always a cause, always, unless it is blocked. Now, it might be blocked by another chemical compound in the body that sort of fights it off. It might be caused by a person having a genetic uh, code that isn't quite right, or innumerable other things. But if it is a cause, it is always a cause, and unle unless it is blocked. And the other option is, it is not a cause. Simple as that. So it's either always a cause, it is a cause, or it isn't. So either it is a cause, or it isn't a cause, is a tautology. That statement is true. I could say that chewing on pencils is or isn't a cause of cancer of the albondigus. That is a true statement. I could say that wearing hats is or isn't a cause of cancer of the albondigus. That is a true statement. It is a true statement because it is a tautology. Tautologies are always true. Therefore, it adds nothing to the logic of the situation. Merely proposing a cause does not prove in any way that it is a cause or give any extra probability to the idea that it's a cause. That is a very subtle but difficult point. If you can understand that, you can understand the real deep hole that probability and statistics have dug themselves. Because they do say that you can ascertain the probability that it's a cause. But it's not true. Because think of this, here's the second point. Now, on any given person or group of people, we can measure innumerable things, not infinite, but large. We could remember, we could measure everybody's genetic code. We could measure everything that this person has eaten over their entire life, where they've lived, how much air they have breathed, uh, what novels they have read, whether or not they do wear hats or chew pencils. We can go on and on, and this list can be fairly large, as you know, if you've done any kind of medical studies. Now, it's almost certain to be true that in these groups, these two groups, this low and this high group, there will be other differences that only apply to the high people and the low people. So suppose, for instance, I'll call this the banana test, that everybody in the high group had eaten in their entire life at least one more banana than the people in the low group. Something like this is surely going to be true. Maybe it's not bananas, maybe it's something else. Now, I said that the two groups were high and low PM 2.5, and I did this statistical test, and I got statistical significance, and that led me to say that PM 2.5 is associated with or linked to or causes the cancer. But then it's an arbitrary label. I could have just as easily put low and high bananas. This is also true of these people that I've measured. Everybody in the low group had one fewer banana. Therefore, I also have to say that the p-value that I got also proves that bananas are a cause of the cancer. And that's true of every other thing that's different between these two groups. And that's absurd. Because, again, this is tautological information we have here. Now, I'll give you another example. So, uh, Roy Spencer, who many of you might know, who does uh, global warming work, uh, he's on our side. I think he did a paper, a spoof paper on his site, um, uh, something like looking at the number of UFO reports and plotting it by the temperature anomaly, something like this, showing that the number, as the number of UFO reports increased, so did the temperature anomaly. Now, we all laugh at that situation. He had statistics, p-values, all this kind of thing in the, in the usual hypothesis test. And we laugh at that, but why? Why are we laughing at that? Why is it absurd? Because we understand the essence of the situation. It's absurd. It's nuts. We understand what's going on with the temperature, and we know it cannot have any causative play with these fictional UFO 
observations. We understand, yet every statistical test, it passed in glory. Yet we're willing to say that PM 2.5 might be a cause of cancer and not the bananas because we're trying to get at something else that we cannot get from these statistical procedures. And this is the idea of essence. Now this returns to an older philosophical view of really of how, uh, how the world works. So before we can do physics, we must first do metaphysics. We must first have a philosophical system. Even saying you have no philosophical system is a philosophical system. And the philosophical system that ruled most people for the greater part of the 20th century was something called empiricism. And so now that we understand a little bit of this, now we understand that, uh, and I, maybe I haven't proved it to your satisfaction, uh, and I'm scarcely likely to do so if I haven't in the short amount of time that I have allocated here, but let me lead you to a little bit of the uh, background in this strange idea that probability and statistics can show cause. So imagine instead of 15 people in the high group having cancer, it was only 14. The p-value is now 0.06. What do we say? It's not significant. What else can we say? I've heard it before elsewhere. I think you, you offered one before. I said it was wrong, but it is still going to be wrong. Chance. chance. Yes. <clears throat> We're saying that chance caused the results. There is no such thing. There is no such thing as chance. Chance is a st epistemological state. It's a state of our knowledge. There is no such thing as a material chance. There is no energy of, called chance. There is no force called chance, nor randomness. Chance or randomness cannot be a cause. It's impossible that they could be a cause. Something physical caused, or biological, I should say, or some combination, caused each of these cancers. It cannot have been chance. Chance and randomness are a product of our epistemology, of our state of knowledge. They basically mean, I don't know what caused these things. So that's fair enough. I could say, I don't know what caused these things. But because if I just add one more person with cancer, I all of a sudden say the cause is definitely PM 2.5, that's a fallacy. Let me show you what's going on here. All right, so I'm going to lead you through a very briefly. I, this is a, all of 20th century philosophy of science here in a slide. Let's play this little game here. Who said this? It's like Jeopardy. I don't know if you can see it in the back. It says the first one is we have no reason, no reason to believe any proposition about the unobserved even after experience. Almost. It should have been. There are no such things as good, positive reasons to believe any scientific theory. The truth of any scientific theory is exactly as improbable, both a priori and in relation to any possible evidence, as the truth of a self-contradictory proposition. That's a long-winded way to say it is impossible. Belief, of course, is never rational. It is always rational to suspend belief. And I might add right away that the gentleman who wrote that asked us to believe that statement. <laughs> the first one, the first statement is by David Hume, and you probably have heard of David Hume. It was David Hume who took Descartes' ideas of skepticism to their logical and uh, appalling conclusion. It was Hume's idea that we can never really observe or understand cause. We can only look at events, this event followed by that event. Everything is entirely loose and separate. Now, Hume had a lot of uh, influence with philosophers, but not so much with scientists, not so much with uh, you know, physicists and doctors and so forth, who actually are trying to find cause and do believe that they have found causes. And of course, I agree that they do, but Hume did not. Hume uh, was very influential in the philosophers, and I say did not inflect the scientists too much. But the next man who is responsible for the next three quotes, Karl Popper, uh, did. He was a logical positivist, uh, not quite part of the Vienna Circle, but uh, one of their associate members. He believed in this idea called falsifiability. Perhaps you've heard of this. 
science, a scientific theory is not a scientific theory unless it is falsifiable. He said that unless you can prove something that is false, it's not scientific, empirically prove, meaning with observation. Now, logical positivism said you can never believe any theory except based on empirical evidence. Should we believe logical positivism then? Because that's not empirically provable. And so, basically, logical positivism died out in the 20th century. David Stove, a philosopher from Australia, basically called it an episode in black comedy. But this idea of poppers became exceedingly popular among scientists. We hear this all the time. That's not falsifiable, not falsifiable so it isn't scientific. Well, it was very influential with R.A. Fisher. He was sort of the father of modern-day frequentist statistics. It was he that developed... Oh, rats, I left my water over there. It was he that... No, no, it's quite fine. Don't worry. It was he that developed the p-value. He loved this idea of poppers that you could never believe anything, but you could disbelieve. And he wanted to build falsifiability into the practice of probability and statistics, so he developed this p-value. He said once the p-value is less than the magic number, he didn't use the word magic number, but once the p-value is smaller than something, you are then allowed to say that the null hypothesis is false. You are allowed to act as if it is false. You are allowed to believe it is false. Now, this is a pure act of will. You've not proven anything false. You haven't come up with a probability that anything is true or false. It is a pure act of will. And that was Neyman and Pearson's criticism of the p-value. There were other statisticians early in the 20th century who said, don't use the p-value because it will lead you to make the kind of mistakes that everybody is now making. Now, the fields are inundated with this kind of thinking, especially in fields like sociology, uh, psychology, and even in medicine, when these PM 2.5 study, oh, that's very sweet of you, thank you very much. Uh, in medicine and so forth, that use p-value, statistical significance, as the proof that I have discovered cause. And we've already seen that can't be true. Now, if the p-value is greater than the magic number, we say we fail to reject, right? We don't say we actually accept the null, and that's because of Karl Popper. We fail to reject, because we're only, always after rejecting, because when we reject something, we falsified. But it's just as nonsensical, because if we take a proposition and say we can never believe any proposition, we can only believe that we have proved it false, that means we're believing a proposition, just like this last thing here. It's self-refuting. P-values are self-refuting. In fact, you could show in an argument, which I won't do here, they add nothing. They add no information uh, to the problem at all. P-values were always an act of will. This is why we need to do something else. We need to look at essence. And I'm going to give you another example. This is why we knew this UFO uh, global warming thing was silly because we understand the essence of the, pro of the problem. And I don't mean just the essence in the colloquial sense. I mean we understand the metaphysical situation of these entities, these beings. We understand temperature. We understand what people are. We understand this nature of thing. We need to understand the whatness or the quiddity, uh, the actual um, understanding of the processes and the powers that are involved, and it's a very difficult thing. Ed showed us this morning, uh, when he was first doing his experiment, his advisor asked him to do and redo and redo and redo, and this was all work like this, all real scientific labor, as we all know when we're involved in studies, is extremely laborious, difficult, hard work, but statistics promises that we could do it in an instant. All we have to do is submit this data to some test, and if the p-value the is we, we have proved our theories, and this is false. I'm sorry, are you uh, dismissing Karl Popper's proposal? Yes, I am. Math, for instance. No mathematical proposition can be falsified. Any, any theorem that we have proved true cannot be falsified. No empirical evidence can ever show a mathematical theorem to be false. Probability is not falsifiability for the most part. Many people use normal distributions and regression and so forth. What's the extent of a normal distribution? What does it give probability to, if I can ask the experts in the audience? Anywhere from negative infinity to infinity. 
so that any observation we make will never falsify a probability statement. That's why you have to say practically falsified, but that has the same epistemic status as practically a virgin. <laughs> it's an act of will. It doesn't have anything to do with anything else. So, um, yes, yes, yes. Okay, I did all that. Aha. Now, I, if I had a pencil here, I could do this. Stump. So let me, let me do this. Let me do this, talk about the essence thing. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna let go of this. What's gonna happen? Why? Do we need a statistical test? No. We understand gravity. We, various levels of understanding of gravity exist. At the, some high level, we understand it's the nature of gravity, the mass of this thing and the mass of the Earth, to bend space, okay? But we also understand it's the power of gravity to cause things to fall. It's not because some equation exists out there, some instrumentalist equation. That's the, the quantification of things. Quantification is very nice, but quantification leaves out a lot of things. For instance, how angry is this talk making you on a scale of minus seven <laughs> to e, e to the fourth power? <laughs> See, Quantification is very nice in science, when we can quantify things, but not everything can be quantified. So we understand gravity. People before Newton understood gravity. They didn't know it as well as he, but that's part of the understanding of essence and cause. Let me give you an example, a controversial example. To prove to you that we need to understand essence and cause. I mean, essence and powers and cause and all these sort of things. We need a new metaphysics. There are, let me get the exact number here. In the world, as of uh, when I wrote this, 1,446, 1,446 grand masters of chess. You, you, you have to be, uh, attain a certain level, you have to have won so many tournaments, take part in so many things, have so many victories, this kind of thing. You have to be good, really good. 1,446. Of these, 33 of them are not men. Okay, we understand the data, that's our data. So there is a, a, the Nigel Short, he is a grandmaster. He caused a brouhaha a few months back in the English press. He said, the reason was because, because, that's a word describing causality, men are more interested in playing chess and they have greater ability. Okay, that's what he said. Amanda Ross, a chess writer, she's not herself a grandmaster, but she is a, 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 a fan and player and, and writer. She said, no, the reason is because of sexism. <laughs> now, I'm not gonna come down on either side of this controversy, but the data equally support both contention. There's nothing in this raw data alone just as there's nothing in this 15 versus uh, 5 data that we had for the PM 2.5, there's nothing in that data alone that supports anything else. You have to look outside the data. Data can certainly inform. I'm not saying toss away data, don't do data analyses and so forth. I'm going to show you how to do data analyses right. But it does say that if we want to understand what's going on, something caused this difference. This is an enormous difference between uh, men and not men in, in, in the grandmasters of chess. Something caused it. It could be we have many different causes. It could be there's only one cause. It could be that Short is right. It could be that Ross is right. But we can't learn from this data alone what the truth is. So we need to understand essence. Now think. Even if, if we do understand cause, which sometimes we do, even more, we don't need to use probability and statistical models to tell us what cause might be. Think about this. You're at the casino. You've uh, been playing roulette in the last 10 times. It's come up red. Is black due? Why not? It's called the gambler's fallacy, we all know that, yes. But why is not black do? If we were to use the statistics, we'd have to say the, the p-value is gonna be one, to, uh, it's gonna be p, it's gonna be two to the minus uh, 10. It's a very low number. 
No, there's no probability. There's no probability in this wheel. Something's causing that ball to rattle around. That's the key. The cause. We all understand there's nothing in the nature of the physics that have changed. It stayed the same. The wheel might have worn infinitesimally from one uh, run to the next. That's true. But we could move to other examples where there is no wearing of parts. We could move to quantum mechanics. And some people think there's an answer to randomness and, you know, and chance and all this kind of thing in quantum mechanics, and I'm very happy to talk about that uh, afterwards. I don't think we have enough time to do that here today, but I have plenty to talk about on quantum mechanics and why that's not a fix to the standard probability and statistical models. Okay, so what we need to do is understand cause. We need to understand essence. Now, PM 2.5. It's plausibly a cause. We understand something of the essence. Well, these small particles, they get into the lungs, they get lodged in there, perhaps they're not cleared right away. It's possible. But still, just by saying something is possibly a cause is no evidence of cause. It doesn't give you anything. Anything could possibly be a cause. But we understand, we're trying to get at this nature of it. In order to find the real nature, we have to understand the etiology of the disease, we have to understand the human body, we have to understand what's going when these particles get in there, maybe it's particular kinds of the particles, how they interact with the lung tissue, all these kinds of really hard things we have to understand, and that may take a long time to figure out, and it may give us the answer we don't want to hear if we're in the government, that is to say it doesn't cause any harm at all. But, in order to answer, to answer the real question, we have to not do the shortcut that probability and statistics seemingly provides us. So, yes, exactly so. Um, if we did know that PM 2.5 was a cause, if we did know it, we understood the nature of it, and as, at a certain level, anybody after this level, no dose response, just assume for the sake of example, everybody was gonna get cancer and less blocked, then again, we don't need to use probability and statistics to try to further prove cause. It's just like the gambler's fallacy again. Once we understand a cause like gravity, we hadn't have to have any kind of statistical model to say anything about this. No one was gonna ask me to repeatedly drop this because we all, at this point, understand the nature of the cause. And it would be the same thing with PM 2.5. We have not reached it with that. Now, there are other things. We're going to st start morphing now into how to do this correctly. And I'm giving you the example in PM 2.5, but this must be done with absolutely every statistical analysis there is, not just PM 2.5. I'm just using this as a running example. For most of the studies I've seen, I cite a bunch of them. Jarrett uh, has a bunch of them. Ross Chow, Nielsen, Dockery et al., Pope et al., Stibe et al., Pope et al. again, De Howe et al., if I'm pronouncing this correctly. All of them have a paper that says basically PM 2.5 causes either mortality or morbidity. Now, the epidemiologist fallacy, what I call the epidemiologist fallacy, is when an epidemiologist or statistician or doctor or somebody says X causes Y, but where he never measures X, never measures X, and where he ascertains through statistical models that X is a cause. Now, the epidemiologist fallacy is a compound, then, of the ecological fallacy, which is when you don't measure what you want to measure and instead measure a proxy and say the proxy is the same as the thing you want to measure. And the uh, ascertaining of cause through probability models. So I call it the epidemiologist fallacy. Without the epidemiologist fallacy, epidemiologists would be out of work. They have these data sets, they go in, they just start playing around, they start looking for p-values that are we p-values and they start publishing. And this is nonsense. So we need to understand first what we're dealing with. All of the papers that I have discovered that have claimed a causative agency for PM 2.5 use the epidemiologist fallacy. I am not certainly an expert in the field, but I have looked long and hard like Willie has have, and every single one of them, the ones that I have cited to you, use the epidemiologist fallacy. And there's a guy named John Gamble. I don't know if you've heard of him. He was, I think, unfortunately for him at the time, because we know, how, we know how evil oil companies are. I think he worked for Chevron. And he has the paper. I think Exxon Mobil. Exxon Mobil, okay. My apologies. He worked for Exxon Mobil at the time. He is now an independent consultant. 
he has the paper that people never cite. And I'm not going to talk much about this. Willie went into it in some detail, and it's not that interesting. At this point, you already know the facts. But he looked at the epidemiologist factor angle, which is to say all of these studies measure some kind of ambient PM2.5, some average level. For instance, Los Angeles. They'll measure the, PM, the average level of PM2.5 in Los Angeles, and then ascribe that to every single person in their study, which is nonsense. Gamble found that has almost no correlation. Uh, he also looked at uh, um, other things, which I thought amusing. There are several studies that uh, don't show any statistical significance, and these are the ones, just as Ed says, the regulators leave out. There's a Seventh-day Adventist study. You've heard of the six cities. Willie showed it in the American Cancer Society study. Um, I'm about to show you these predictive methods, and I applied, Jim helped me out on this, to, to get the data from the ACS. They claim that they'll let researchers have it if they could show a good reason for it. I applied in the normal process and showed them my bona fides, all this kind of thing, and I was rejected. So they actually, like everybody else, don't want to know how bad things are. But I'm, I did them on my own anyway, but you know, I'm guessing these are all informal results which I'm about to show you because I don't have the actual data, it's just a guess. Okay, but that Gamble paper, he also found, he, he did two amusing things. I don't know if you've heard about this before, but they looked at animal models. They did do the animal models. They loaded up these rabbits with dust, more than uh, 20 pack a day, or however many pack a day smokers, two pack a day, I guess it was, or something like this, for a long period of time, no increase in mortality. Eh, doesn't matter. We still have C these wee p values that show association between mortality and, or morbidity and PM2.5, so they go with that. And he also did this. Um, it's very true that smokers, cigarette smokers, inhale about 20,000 micrograms per cubic meter of PM2.5. And all of these studies that he cited, the risk ratio, we're about to talk a lot about risk ratios, or not a lot about, just a little, anywhere from 2 to 2.3. But the risk ratio for going just 20 micrograms above baseline PM2.5, anywhere from 1 to 10, was about 1.3. 1.17 to 1.7. So if you work that out, if you give the equivalent of the PM2.5 as cigarette smoke, that means that PM2.5 must be, Gamble proved, about 150 to 300 times more toxic than smoking two packs of cigarettes a day for many years. So just going out and breathing the air outside here is more toxic for you than being a chain smoker. That's what the results prove. So that's why we need these predictive methods. So this is what I'm about to show you. So risk ratio is a very common um, way to, to present results. Everybody thinks it's just kosher as anything. It is extremely misleading. It's a terrible way to show results, and I'm going to prove that to you. So now I've reached the point where, OK, let's just accept the findings as we have them. And what do they really imply? Now, I already said I don't believe that we can ascertain or ascribe cause to PM2.5, given the data we have. But let's just give them a break and assume that it's true. Now let's look at the way it's reported and used. Risk ratio is the most common way, as we've heard in some of the other talks. It's very simple, this equation here. It's the probability of having the disease, the malady, whatever, given that you were exposed, divided by the same probability given you were not exposed. So let's look at just two particular values of this risk ratio. So you have 1 in 10 million versus 2 in 10 million. And we saw, I guess it was either Ed's or Willie's talk, I forget which, that they had just these, this is one of the EPA's justifications. So I, I got this from the EPA website. Now it turns out, we'll let, let's assume this other thing here. Let's assume that God himself has told us that these probabilities are correct. There's no doubt about them. Then you can calculate. It turns out the probability of at least one person having cancer of the albondigas, given they were exposed to PM2.5, is about 33%. And the probability of at least one person having cancer, given that they were not exposed, is about 18%. That's a risk ratio of 1.8. We've gone from two, which is God himself told us is the correct number, down to considering this. Now, where did I get this number from? Well, 
risk ratio only applies to single people. It only applies to one individual at a time. And if you're just one individual, you don't care about the risk ratio, you care about these individual probabilities. If I'm not exposed, the probability is one in 10 million. If I am exposed, it's two in 10 million. So what if I'm gonna take this and apply it over all of Los Angeles? After all, if I'm, if I'm CARB, the California Air Resources Board, and I wanna implement a action of some kind, a regulation of some kind, a law, then I need to apply it over a real population. So this is the way, if you work out these numbers, the probability of at least one person getting it in the exposed group and at least one person getting it in the not exposed group works out to be this. The risk ratio has suddenly dropped. If you do it for New York City, which has, LA has about four million people, New York has eight, the risk ratio drops again to about 1.7. If you do it for the entire United States, the risk ratio drops to something just over one. So right away we begin to see that reporting risk ratio, I haven't come to the, the fun stuff yet, is not the best way of reporting these things. So here's the interesting one. Now this is the paper that I looked at in depth. And my, I wrote a bunch of, I wrote an official comment on this and it was submitted to uh, the California Air Resources Board at one of their meetings. Jim has actually the audio tape of the, or the MP3 file or something of this, and you can listen uh, to their comments about my criticisms. And basically, I think I told this group before that they considered what I had to say and they basically said, well, you know, Dr. Briggs is right, but everybody else makes these same mistakes, therefore, we don't want to be different. I'm not kidding, and Jim will, he, he can show you the audio tape of this and uh, it'll be fine. But I want to use a real life example here. This is my best reading of this Jared. He's got a series of papers, but this is based on the ACS data. His high watermark, the highest risk that he found was 1.06. And I think for a cardiac disease, I forgot, but it was at uh, MIs or death, I can't remember, it doesn't matter. <clears throat> the point here is for illustration, whatever this was, it's some kind of disease. I wanted to find a risk that was regulation worthy. So two in 10,000 is more than regulation worthy according to the EPA. I got this directly, that's well within their bounds for considering a government action. You know, EPA agents now are armed, right? They carry weapons, some of these guys, they go out in the field when they're testing things. So they're dead serious about these things. Now it turns out that Jarrett's risk ratio 1.06 if we use this two times 10 to the minus four, the two and 10,000 watermark, that works out to be 1.89. That's the probability of uh, having the disease or morbidity for the not exposed group. Now let's apply this to Los Angeles, okay? We need to apply this. It just doesn't make any difference. Yes, this 1.06 had a small p-value. Yes, he in fact used the epidemiologist fallacy. He used this land use regression model to guess exposure. He never measured exposure on anybody ever. Nobody did. It's just a wild, it's nonsense is what it is, but it doesn't matter. Let's accept that it's true and let's apply what he's got. Now these are not normal distributions. They kind of look at their binomials because remember, we're assuming these numbers are true. We're assuming that the, this is the best case in their world. What I have here is this dash group, the middle one, this dash one right here. These are the two million people. I'm, a, I'm a basically assuming here I don't have anything else I could do, that half the people in LA did not get exposed and half the people did to this high level of PM 2.5. Basically, the, there's a 99.99% .99 chance, I'm gonna go through quickly here, anywhere from about, what, 330 to about 450 people will get cancer in the low group, the people who weren't exposed, with about 380 being the most likely number and about 400 people in the people who were exposed. That's a difference of about 20 people. So all of LA, the difference is about 20 people. That's what I can expect. Even assuming their things. So how much money would you pay to eliminate PM 2.5? Okay, that's too much. Because why? 
because we don't know PM 2.5 is a cause. This is assuming it's a cause. We still don't know it's a cause. So if we eliminated PM 2.5, what's the only thing we can say? We, we eliminated it completely. We, we have uh, the most draconian regulations you can imagine, and we completely eliminate it. No, we, we already know that people in the low group also get cancer, so something else is causing their cancers. All we can say is we don't have PM 2.5 anymore. So therefore, what we're saying is everybody is in the low group. Okay. This is the real curve to look at. This is now the dashed line is assuming all 4 million LA residents are not exposed. All 4 million residents are not exposed. It's anywhere from like 680 people to about 800, is that 850? There's a 99.9% .9 chance. That's how many cancer cases we'll see. That's a predictive model. This is no longer confidence intervals or p-values or any of this kind of stuff. I'm saying, given the information that I have, what's the probability of stuff I don't yet know, which is the future? Now, given that half are exposed and half are not exposed, this is the number of people we expect to see. This is without any regulation of PM 2.5, assuming PM 2.5 is a cause. And the difference is still just about 20 people. And the maximum you could get, if you take this point here and this point here, meaning the most worst situation you can imagine, a 99.9% .9 chance of having 867 people or so having cancer if I didn't do anything. And the worst case scenario here, meaning uh, the best case scenario, meaning only like 690 people got cancer, is a savings of 200 lives. But the probability of that happening is only like 0.005. The overwhelming probability is if you were to eliminate PM 2.5 completely, this is using Jarrett's data from best I can tell, eliminate it completely, the best is a savings that you could expect of about 20 lives. The best. But notice, I just took his 1.06 from his paper and said, that's it. Is that true, though? When we do a statistical model, are we certain of these estimates? No, there's some uncertainty in these estimates. There's some plus or minus. And there's various mathematical ways to deal with these uncertainties. The way I used and the way that I advocate everybody use, and I, I don't have any time to explain this, is to use the Bayesian posterior predictive distribution. In other words, I want to say what the future will be like integrating out all uncertainty I have in these mathematical parameters. So I'm going to basically take that 1.06 and the plus or minus whatever Jared had published, and I'm going to put that plus or minus in here and add the uncertainty. Okay? I'm going to add that uncertainty. I have to. I can't just use the 1.06. That's not fair. That's not even taking their published results seriously. I need to take that plus or minus into account. This is the result. This right here assumes, this dashed line, that if I removed PM 2.5, all 4 million residents of LA would not be exposed. This is the number of, I, I guess it's cardiac cases, I don't know exactly what, MIs or something. Anywhere from 500 to 1,000 people, there's a 99% chance. 99.99% chance of that. However, if half were exposed to PM 2.5 and half not, the savings in lives now is about, from the peak of this to the peak of this, is two. Now that should be stunning to you, but you're not used to seeing statistics put in this way. This is the probability distribution of the number of cancer cases or heart attacks I expect to see if I don't do anything assuming that Jarrett's model is correct. It differs almost not at all. It's a little more certain because we're saying that cancer is certainly, I mean, we're saying that PM5 is certainly causing the cancer or the disease. So it's a little bit narrower. But the difference, the real difference, the real expected difference that we can see is trivial. And that's assuming PM2.5 is a cause. We don't know PM 2.5 is a cause, so the real savings are much less. And if we factor in the epidemiologist fallacy, any purported savings disappear entirely. And this is the way that all of these studies should be done. You cannot use hypothetical populations. You have to use real predictive methods that say nothing about all these parameters, 
like p-values and confidence intervals and all this nonsense. And you have to do it in this predictive way. You have to make real predictions. Now notice, I've made a prediction. Or Jared has. What do I do next? I see if it's true. I wait for de This is what everybody else has to do. Why is it that when the model itself tells us the theory is desirable that I'm removed from the responsibility of checking? That happens in global warming. It happens for anything the government wants to regulate. All of a sudden, just the hint that it might be true, which is good for them. They're interested. They're an interested party. Having something that needs to be regulated means they're in business. So they're a very interested party in this. The government somehow thinks that they're uninterested, which is utterly and absolutely false. So let me just recap here. We did a lot. What I wanted to show you, and I called this talk the crisis of evidence because that's exactly what it is. At least in medicine, um, in these type of fields, they're making a stab at understanding what the real causes are for these things. But this is not true in some fields. In sociology, for instance, they ask um, undergraduate students a bunch of questions. They say the answers are caused by whatever theory that they have, and that's it. It's never replicated. But then that becomes, somebody else does that. You know, we didn't do this in black students, okay? We'll do it in black students. Someone says, we didn't do it here in only women. They'll do it only women. And then all of a sudden, all these errors build up, and then we have a body of knowledge. We have all these papers, and it looks like something is going on. And they all point to each other. It's just like the linear, uh, the no threshold, the, the linear, it's exactly the same kind of thing. Everybody just keeps assuming the stuff and nobody checks. I mean, it used to be in physics when you made things, and if you're an engineer, you have to check your stuff against reality. So the way to do statistics is to first try to understand, like everybody does, the hard way. And if you're not going to do that, at least do this in a predictive way and then wait and see if your model has any damn value before proclaiming that it does. So it's, uh, it's not a panacea. There's not saying that statistics is going to certainly provide us good models. Uh, and just like the chess example, cause is underdetermined. We can't tell from the data. So we have to do a lot of hard work. Um, if I've just given you a little bit of disquiet, I, that's all I think I could do at this point. I have paper on this at Archive. Uh, just look up my name at Archive and you can read a fuller version of this. And that's the rest of my contact information. It's probably in the thing anyway. But thank you very much. You said either it causes cancer or it doesn't cause cancer. But my understanding was, I mean, you know, sometimes we think maybe it takes three things together to cause the cancer. So given that, isn't it useful to, to sort out confounding variables? Yes. That, that's what I say. So it's either always a cause or it is sometimes blocked. It can be blocked by missing a catalyst, for instance. Oh, okay. All right. Yes, exactly right. But that was just a subtle philosophical point to show you that you cannot, it's like multiplying an algebraic equation by one, a tautology in logic. It doesn't provide additional information. But finding all these things like Ed showed us, he had this, uh, the cause was there, and they went and they did a counterfactual. They, they blocked some pathway, and there was the block, and, the and, the, and then the cause disappeared. So it's just those okay, kind of so things. So then you go looking for the essence, yep. but it's useful in that. Yep. Yeah, okay. Matt, that was a brilliant talk. I want to make a plea for you to stay in California <laughs> long enough that you can California. get a, long enough that you can get a critical mass of citizens in this state to understand that CARB and South Coast Air Quality Management District are running a scam on the entire population with regard to their regulations on PM 2.5. Please stay here until we get that critical well, mass. Nobody wears ties in California. I'm afraid I would feel terrible without a tie. <laughs> I'm a New Yorker. Please. <laughs> How, do we have to? Okay, go ahead. Quick question and yes, a comment. I think you said that the p-value was somewhat, well, it's an arbitrary concept, or what it equals is arbitrary? That's my what it equals is, a, it's, the mathematics works out beautifully, but deciding what to do based on a p-value is an act of will. 
It, it's, it's, ar it, it's completely arbitrary. But what you do with it, it is, is arbitrary in the extreme. But the concept of it is not an act. Of the, the mathematics of it are pristine, which right. is why these guys can go to work. They can go to work on this stuff, prove theorems and so forth. But any mathematician, they live in. A, you know, mathematicians are weird. I, you know, I'm one of them, and they don't always uh, come down to reality. They don't understand how this stuff is going to apply in real life. And you can't just because it's an equation, and you could. F match the terms in that to real life things doesn't mean it works for those real life things. And, and so that's the problem with the p-value. It's my understanding that setting the p-value at a certain magical setting yeah. is completely arbitrary. I can decide that you know, a much larger p-value could still be statistically sure. significant because that is arbitrary. And uh, although the field of statistics is a strong emphasis in my life, I am not going to get in the ring with you. I might be able to get in the ring with you on philosophy, and I'd like to talk to you. Sure, more. sure, sure. It's, a, it's an honor to, to hear you and meet you in person. Uh, the, the comment I wanted to make is that I'm perfectly willing to think that possibly all science itself is a, a result of a mental disorder like apophenia, because <laughs> we are looking and we are designed to look for patterns and to try to understand causality and find causality. I believe it's part of human DNA to do so. That's also and, true. And, and the methods of which we are coming up with and, and finding that may actually be part of creation itself, the methodology, you know, it, we, we are designed to do this, but when we do it in error, we're finding patterns that really don't exist, like yeah. the face on Mars, and when we do it right, well, we may be finding the origin of things, or what is the I'm right there with you. Thanks. So. I'm right there. That's, uh, I, I, we agree. Uh, back to Karl Popper and falsifiability yep. and tautologies. Tautologies are not fals falsifiable. It's, it's, uh, it could be this or that, and no matter what happens. And that's what the climate... Uh, climatist politicians are constantly throwing out as, as tautologies. There's a there's a blizzard. It proves global warming. Yeah. There's a drought. It proves yeah. global yeah. warming. No matter what up or down, which way it goes, no matter what the the actual data is it, in their mind and in the popular consciousness, Popper, it always Popper proves was wrong. that they're right. Popper was wrong, but he had a very good motive. It's the same thing. He basically was looking at UFOs and these kinds of things and uh, homeopathy and the like saying that what, any observation confirms the theory, these people said. Right. Uh, and that's exactly what we have with global warming, too. Well, for for I, politicians I, especially, okay, any I, observation confirms. There's nothing that will disconfirm. I'm a non-scientist, and I've, I've written an article. It's in, it's in your packet there, uh, uh, Climate Change, Where is the Science? And I'm daring to, to challenge the scientists on, on their... Sure. Lack of scientific we, I, method. I could go on and on about global warming, but right. So I'd, I'd be very interested. The in, whole topic in, is in you me cri nauseous. critiquing my piece as to whether I've uh, <laughs> sure. you know, made it. Made it. Sure, 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 sure. Do we? Uh, just the same question about Popper. I don't get it. I mean, the, if the falsifiability is a useful way of evaluating scientific propositions, and that's what Popper explained. Although it's false, it, because if I tell you. If I tell you uh, the probability the temperature will be some number, okay, the, the probability, using a normal model, for instance, the probability will always be greater than zero. Therefore, there's no way you could falsify that thing with any observation. It doesn't it, apply to every situation. It doesn't apply to, that's exactly right, it doesn't apply whenever you use probability, but unfortunately we have to use probability to quantify our uncertainty. So it doesn't work for those kinds of, it does work sometimes, uh, don't get me wrong, but it doesn't, uh, it doesn't work for most of science. Falsifiability has very little role to play. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. And it's time for lunch, and so if you could make your way over as quickly as possible, back to where we had breakfast, the Lake Arrowhead Room, we'll have lunch. See you there.